Uh, and we thought the forum, as it was developing uh, in early days, was significant enough to be a financial uh, sponsor, which we're very proud to do. Uh, look, I stand here um, to represent birds, particularly in the wetlands. I uh, understand the hydrology, uh, but I enjoy these days being able to be specifically able to represent um, the, the uh, birds' um, interest, and I think that's uh, important for us to uh, keep that focus on. Now, we will seamlessly uh, connect with uh, Chris, and we've got our presentation organised an hour ago. So uh, we, we're, we're, uh, we're going to just dovetail that. I know roughly what he's going to be talking about. Um, what I do want to do is just say that we are, um, I'm also representing Janelle Stephen. Janelle can't be here, an apology. Janelle is um, recently appointed academic at Murdoch University, but also is now the convener, not chair, convener of BirdLife WA, and we really enjoy her energy and her national recognition in, in BirdLife WA. And Chris, as I said, has already been um, introduced. So uh, what uh, I was hoping that, um, that uh, other staff would um, present when we first talked about the forum, but those two opportunities and the people evaporated. Uh, so I thought, realised I'd better do something. So I had to get my skates on not too long ago and, and, and sort of beef up on uh, wetlands and south coast and, and, and the birds that occupy them. So I don't stand here as an expert, but what I did was to review the literature that was available, and some of it's been looked at already, uh, and to do, undertake some semi-structured interviews, which I did, which is really interesting, and then get out and have a look myself. So that's the basis by uh, which I present uh, this uh, first part. I want to first of all, as I think we should, look at the human dimension, because it's humans we're talking about in all of this. And I will once again, like all, pay respects um, to uh, the, the uh, Indigenous um, people involved, as um, uh, Auntie Carol um, so eloquently pointed out, I think it's fantastic. Um, but I think it's the knowledge, it's the pre-colonial knowledge that we really want. You know, folk then uh, lived uh, the landscape. They uh, were holistically a part of uh, complex ecological systems, and that's not by choice, that's just how they lived. We don't do that. We uh, should live as if we were to live off the landscape through these natural systems uh, much more. And I think uh, my point really is that bird life could do well to adopt more of uh, the culture and knowledge of what's there. I don't pretend to represent that myself here now. So I think that's really important and really applaud the initiatives that have been taken on the South Coast. I'm going to talk now about conflicting local values. Everyone in the room knows the South Coast has been outstanding since the 90s, even earlier, for you know, uh, conservation land care effort uh, uh, with community contribution. And uh, from a study I did as a consultant many, many years ago, uh, the South Coast and Yass, just out from Canberra, were the two outstanding regions in all of Australia that adopted... Uh, biodiversity as a conservation value. And I don't think that's gone away. It's probably been enhanced since then. So I think those things need to be recognised. Uh, some of the shires um, were award-winning in those early days and South Coast NRM, the former iteration, uh, was formed. You know, so it's a fantastic opportunity, but you don't have to dig too deep in any community or any region to find that there is conflict and that conflict is uh, often about natural resources and the losers from that conflict is almost always the environment and, from my point of view, um, birds. Um, now, I want to read um, a landholder statement that represents um, that uh, situation of conflict. This is a, a statement uh, with pep, uh, permission from the landholder and I'll explain the circumstance in a sec. The statement says, or part of it says, the pair of nesting swans who regularly nest here departed after the first day. It was their second and third attempt at nesting. There were hundreds, if not thousands, of water birds here up into December and part of January. Uh, there are still birds here, but not in the great numbers there were. Some of the species we've observed recently are Rufus night heron, a few spoonbills, ibis, dozens of whitehead stilts and black wing stilts, uh, a dozen black fronted um, dotter, or a small flock of common green shank, a pair of white-faced herons, about 200 pink-eared ducks, uh, Pacific black ducks, mountain ducks, grey teal. We, haven't, we can't see the musk ducks who breed here anymore. Um, the cormorants, wood ducks, hundreds of ibis and greater numbers of spoonbills have gone. The migratory and other shorebirds appear to be benefiting from the expanses of mud and very, very shallow water, but not for much longer as it'll be completely dry uh, very soon unless there's a major um, 
weather event. Now, that was in February 2020, I got that, and that was uh, an email uh, after a 48-hour pumping of a wetland uh, in right over Christmas, I might say Christmas New Year, uh, Christmas uh, Boxing Day, uh, of, of, of a wetland uh, that was in a reserve uh, that was uh, holding those birds. So uh, straight away, as bird life, we said, whoa, what's going on here? Uh, and it was not, I have to say, it wasn't illegitimate uh, pumping, but it certainly was pumping for human use that uh, caused a loss of bird habitat instantly. Uh, so we just raised concern about whether that's a common occurrence. But, uh, and I understand it's not a common occurrence, but it's an indicator of what can happen in a dry year, in a drying climate. Uh, you know, if there is conflict, humans win. So uh, we need to represent uh, more of birds. Now, I want to talk about how we might perceive wetlands from a bird point of view. And um, un not unlike the fire triangle, I talk about a uh, water bird habitat triangle. It's very simple, uh, but important. Uh, breeding, birds want uh, wetlands for three things. Largely, they want it for breeding, uh, uh, feeding and, and, and refuge. Now, breeding uh, is not just a matter of measuring spatial, you know, fringing vegetation. Uh, it varies a lot for different species. For some of the crakes, rails and bitterns, I understand, they need, um, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you know, sedgy, rushy vegetation, whereas the colonial nesters need um, well-established trees, healthy. Uh, feeding's really important too. The macrovertebrate study is, is uh, terrific to find out what's happening, but we need more and more wetlands, I think Michael suggested. Uh, if I just give an example, a couple of spoonbills, yellowbill spoonbills, um, require, as most water birds do, about 30% of their body weight daily coming from uh, wetlands or another source. So those two spoonbills over the period of um, incubation and, and brooding of young require about 75 kilograms of um, biomass to just raise those young. Now, they've got to get that out of a wetland uh, or go to a, an adjacent estuary or... Um, or foreshore for that. So, you know, what is in the lakes is what is really important. A water body alone doesn't, doesn't cut it for birds. And refuge, they need summer drought. In a drying climate, they need drought. So they need um, refuge e either from, you know, predators or, or for just general loafing pr purpose they do most of. So then in the role that I took, uh, I thought I'd better find out where um, the wetlands are that are important. So I asked broadly at one of the first meetings I was at, Don was there, uh, you know, where's the wetlands map? And I was told there isn't one for the south coast for this region. And I was actually recommended to look at you know, the touring guides or the, or the almost the, um, the topo maps, which, which is good to do anyway. So, uh, and I understand that from information presented yesterday, which I wasn't at, uh, there is, you know, a better basis for it now, which I applaud. So I'll just go through these quickly. I won't go into detail. Um, there is uh, a lot of options that I looked at going through, um, you know, large-scale uh, geographic information systems, uh, which uh, were good but didn't depict at a local scale anything that was uh, relevant in my view. Uh, the semi wetland classification, most know far better than myself, but uh, I tried to look at and have heard that they don't really apply from a bird conservation point of view adequately. Good help. Uh, there's national wetlands, perhaps Chris can cover those a bit better than myself. Uh, I also want to talk a little bit about Steve Elson. I don't think Steve's he hasn't seen, but if you get a little bit of Steve, you get a lot of knowledge very quickly. Steve is the environmental officer located out at, um, at, um, at the sh uh, Shire of Jerramunga, you know. Uh, and I'll talk, a, 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 you know, he, in the 20 minutes I have with him, drew lines on the sand, in the sand at a local level, well informed, that made a lot of sense to me when I came out of it. So we want to know what makes some uh, wetlands suitable and others not. Uh, let me talk a little about a bloke called Ted Knight. Ted's a um, retired biosecurity officer I had some dealings with up at, uh, up at, um, at uh, Mount Barker. Now, I rang Ted for a bit of an interview because Ted and some of his mates are inimitable in style. They stood in camouflage in lakes, you know, um, from dawn and then somehow through to dusk with an esky in camouflage on a boogie board in camouflage looking for starlings. So they're sitting there armed. So they knew birds better than any. And Ted said, look, there's a lake on Springdale Road, it's a bit east of, of our study area. He said that it's just full of junk and it's, everything's dead and it's salt affected, but the spoonbills nest there. 
And it, you, you know, that's, you know, you, you would classify it as degraded and no value. Yet, according to Ted, who stood there, uh, he said it's a high value wetland. So, we need to get a bit better knowledge as to what it is that determines, for example, spoonbill to prof prolifically breed in that wetland out there. So, I think we've got a lot to learn put together from a, a bird point of view. Uh, so the conclusion I draw from that is we need, really do need, a systematic wetlands map at the level, at the scale that's relevant locally, that local folk can work on, uh, and an inventory uh, for th that, uh, of them that, are, you know, that's classified for birds, not just hydrology. Look, I'll put this up as the world's worst slide, and, and quite deliberately so, because uh, I'm not going to go through it in detail. I just want to represent, as, as Michael and Sarah did, there was a, there's been a lot of survey effort. Uh, and it, it, you know, that slide sort of represents just the headline of that survey effort. Um, and from the 60s and 70s, when birds were, water birds were being surveyed for duck hunting purpose, uh, using the, the fees from duck hunting to see what was there, through to someone, perhaps a minister, wanted to know how many coots and swans there were, through to, as been, has been better represented, you know, salinity um, impact um, assessment of water birds going through. I do want to draw out that, um, as has been mentioned, Roger Yance um, led a, a large amount of survey effort and summarised it for the 80s. Uh, that was statewide. There was over 14, nearly 1,500 wetlands surveyed. Um, they, they had just short of 25,000 bird records, uh, measuring 3.2 million birds. But of all of those records, which is the bit I did, was to go through and sift out, only 2.17% are relevant to the study area. So we've got a great database, but it doesn't really represent what's in the study area. Uh, adequately, and when I tried to geolocate some of them, uh, they're all over the place. I sent a hand-drawn map. Uh, said this is one, and that was up at Calbarry. Uh, so, but I understand Adrian Pinder and others associated are, are working on that. So, a lot of data there, really hard to use, hard to locate to our specific local area. Uh, the other thing I want to draw out from this is uh, oh, also Steve Elson once again pops up, having done a very good report. Uh, for Green Skills Denmark for the Green uh, Cranbrook Lake System. That's the sort of stuff we really need. I do want to draw out from this the first dot point is the 2016 paper by um, Gench, uh, Lane, Clark and Gench, which I think is the benchmark pa paper. I treated it that way. It summarises all of that. And importantly for me, it um, I, I might say that it only... Uh, comes up with four wetlands that are relevant in the area, uh, so there's, there's many, many more, but it does actually provide a framework for those four. Importantly, they come up with the concept of, of sensitive water bird species, which I think is important and want to adopt. They had nine, and I added one more in, um, uh, to just to make a ten, I thought it was important, I'll show you that in a sec. Um, numerically, th these, these species are defined, uh, their definition of mine, as being numerically small populations for the study area. Additionally, they're rarely recorded in high numbers anywhere, not just the study area. Uh, they're known to occur in relatively few um, wetlands and uh, they're known to breed in relatively few wetlands. So they're sensitive to, to change. Now, I need to point out, out of all of those um, studies uh, that were done, uh, only half of the 10 species I'm going to present up there present uh, have any records in this, in this study area. So they could be here, they should be here, but they're not. So the 10 that I've picked, I've added in chestnut teal because it's to the south coast, it's this area that you come to find them. Uh, but they're the ones that I think are benchmark species that we should focus on. The bittens are in there, but when it's not a focus on rare and endangered species, it's those that are sensitive to the area. Uh, I'll go quickly through them for, for time, but you'll know them probably quite well. The freckled duck, not in the area. Uh, but should be. The bitten, you know, well now. The blue-billed duck is the only diver duck, so that needs a bit of depth uh, to in, in its wetland, uh, whereas spotless crake doesn't. They need uh, prolonged uh, shallow water. Uh, beautiful. Yeah, I, look, I'll put the photo credits up there, not mine. There's a couple of very good photographers uh, being represented there. The shy, but often not very shy, buff-banded rail. Um, the, uh, I've talked about the yellow-billed spoonbill. Now, they do breed on, on the south coast. Uh, the uh, pied, little pied cormorant there included uh, for all those criteria reasons, but it is a colonial nester and needs specific habitat. Uh, the uh, Nankeen night heron, um, and the one I put in was the chestnut teal, and uh, hard to find elsewhere now, uh, but definitely down on the south coast you do. 
and the swamp harrier. Surprisingly, it does nest in, um, in reedy areas, and obviously its numbers aren't going down, uh, but it is a sensitive um, breeder and, and uh, being here. So I want to talk then, uh, what I did then after that, after saying, well, here's 10 species I need to find out about. I'm like, oh, that's a doddle. I'll just go to bird data. Everyone knows bird data. Hopefully it's the, it's the uh, platform on which people have been recording birds, including the atlas going back to the 70s, now captured by, by bird life. And, uh, and then those who are sort of thinking that they're more advanced as birders, they tend to use eBirds. So I thought, oh, I'll have a look at both of those. That's the international platform. Uh, and I couldn't find anything. So I went to a younger bod, uh, Jeremy Ring Ringmar, who works for, for BirdLife, and said, Jeremy, have a fiddle with this, see if you can do better than myself. And so Jeremy came back with an email, as you can read up there. He says, regrettably, there isn't enough data on the species, that's the 10, that you listed to draw anything reasonable from it in terms of uh, um, population size trends over time. The distribution maps are similarly bleak looking. For example, the map of the freckled duck shows there are only half a dozen or so records, uh, and that, that's not for the area. Uh, these are just, uh, aren't a lot of, there just aren't a lot of people birding on the small lakes in the area. The next day he came back after having a look at eBird and said, eBird's similarly few records. So we can't, we thought we could just dump out of the, the databases that exist, uh, but we can't, it's just not there. So then I look at what it is that um, we can do about that, uh, and we can, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of keen amateur bird watchers, particularly since COVID. You know, the people have come out of the woodwork to go birding. Uh, and they go out on campouts and excursions, but they'd really to come out, prefer to come out on uh, structured uh, surveys. You know, Cons Council WA is oversubscribed by keen volunteers uh, wanting to go out and do structured surveys. So the opportunity is there. So, Sarah, we can go back to the good old days, the 80s, when RAU and our bird life, you know, teamed up with with calm as it was and, and did a duo, and I think that's a big opportunity in my view. Bird, birdos, um, and I've, I've found out to my own, you know, sort of um, fault, uh, will only want to go where birds are, so I was told quite bluntly. Whereas, you know, if you want to do a survey, getting a zero result is really important. But I think the opportunity is there to draw people out of bird watching into survey. That's a big thing, citizen science. Professional bird lives, a bit like Aboriginal folk, uh, they live by birding, so they need to know it. And there's some very good professional birders in WA. They have huge knowledge, and uh, I think they should be better engaged in, in even if it's professionally, uh, in these sort of programs. Uh, Well-informed locals, you know, not just Steve Elson, but there's a lot of people, for example, around Bremer, they know they're birds, and we don't engage with them. Uh, it's only when you get down and, and, and get into comfort zone that they'll actually talk openly about birds. They know it. Uh, Community-based NGOs don't need to state it in this room. Uh, and, and, and really building on bold regional initiatives, obviously gone well, Link and what Green, um, Green Skills is doing is, is, is some examples. So uh, I think that's the big opportunity. Come back to Steve in, um, in uh, Bremer. There's the swamp, you know, there's lots of, lots of signs up for the swamp and no one knows it there unless you go in and illegally cut firewood from the swamp, which a lot's going on. But Steve looked at the swamp um, because they've got a workshop right next to it, and that's his map he sent of the breeding that went on in 2021 after it filled the first time in 10 years. And it's prolific breeding. It was just amazing to be there. Uh, and why? It's a swamp, it's ephemeral, uh, it, it, um, it, uh, yeah, and it's small, uh, but it's very close to the coast, being in Bremer. And so it's a food source. So if you look into that you know, habitat triangle, it, it ticks all the boxes and it worked. Um, I just want to go through, and this is going to be stating the obvious, but I think the obvious has to be stated for birds, uh, the threats to, um, to habitat, and obviously it's um, changes in inundation to wetlands. In a wet year, uh, birds breed a lot, but, you know, when they are dry out or are drained, then, uh, then they don't. Um, groundwater levels, you know, whether they're increasing through salinity or, or changing, and the impact of salinity is huge, but you've heard lots about that. And, and once the wetlands go... Uh, uh, they're gone from a bird point of view for all the reasons you've heard. One of the four that was mentioned in that uh, seminal paper that I talked about um, during the period of the study, which was a short period, instantly went out. That was one on private land. So this is, this is happening, this is real. Competing water resource use, I've given an example of that. Uh, fire, now that was brought loud and clear to me that fire was a point of conflict for habitat. Um, burning regimes needs to be sorted from this point of view, birds lose. 
um, and declining fridging vegetation. You know, why on earth have we got stock uh, still going, after all we've done in the 90s, still going into wetlands? And you drive around and there's most are unfenced. So, you know, have to have to feel frustrated about that. And increasing recreational use, um, for example, lakes with boats and, and, and similar. Uh, you just go down and you get stories around Bremer, for example, of the huge increase of four-wheel drives concentrated over weekends uh, and increasing acidity, um, which, you know, needs to be measured. So I want to identify then some of the landscape priorities from uh, these observation points of view. And, and we need, as, as I think always, we need to start with the conceptual framework. Many have them. I just think what we've got in that habitat triangle, you know, provides us with that, something to work from. Uh, we use, need to use the, the data and modelling. We can't just fiddle around lines and sound are good, but we need to bring the local knowledge in with, um, with obviously, uh, model data, really important. We need to re review the wetland classification relevant to birds in the region. Um, capturing local knowledge, there's got to be a better effort to do that, you know, whether it's through bird life volunteers or, you know, um, better local effort. Uh, Re-establishing um, organisation-based regional wetland surveys. Um, there's a big gap, you know, all those, all that list that I put up, the horrendous list, stopped and hasn't been adequately uh, repeated. Um, and a range, a broader range of aquatic ecological studies, I think that's been covered, but, you know, Steve said, we just don't know anything about the lakes around, around here. You know, he said we need a, a, a you know, aquatic centre or, you know, a, you know, sort of something that can get community involved in measuring this stuff. Um, so citizen science, as I've measured several times, for systematic surveys, good. So the bold new initiatives that um, could be suggested is uh, starting with uh, looking at water bird trends and threat analysis. So that data does need to be looked at, uh, but we need to benchmark it and we need to start monitoring so that we can actually get the trends relative to these important wetlands here. Paleo drainage pumping, if I don't know what happened yesterday, but if it, there is talk of pumping them, then let's uh, build in opportunities for wetlands. I've seen it internationally and here. There's, you know, great opportunities if it's done well. But it's not just a matter of dig a hole, put water in, birds come. Not like that at all. Um, chain of lakes restoration initiatives, if you just hang around locally, there's a lot of talk about it. And some bold initiatives, it's not my role to... To, to introduce, but, but there's some fantastic regional initiatives in looking at chain of lakes restoration. Um, then, as you know, um, we talked briefly about South Coast Wetland Centre, I'm sure these organisations will claim that um, there's adequate uh, uh, capacity here, but, but could there be a local um, wetland centre that people can, you know, feel they're able to contribute to? And then support for landholder initiatives for landscape restoration and reconstruction. Uh, and finally, I just will alert, and hopefully we can pick this up at some stage, there is an opportunity with somehow bird life involvement for a three-year study to do all this stuff. Uh, and, and I'd like to substantiate that opportunity if we, if we, if we can as we go through. So um, thanks very much. That's the people I spoke to and, and talked with. So I'll hand over to Chris.